Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to another ATP video. In the last two videos we talked about Pseudomonas, E. coli and Shigella. Today we're going to discuss the fourth gram-negative bacteria on our list and that is Salmonella. Salmonella is a gram-negative bond. She is motile, non-lactose fermenter, oxidase negative and can produce hydrogen sulfide. Salmonella species grows in colorless colonies on McConkie's agar since they can't ferment lactose. And since salmonella produces hydrogen sulfide, salmonella species will grow in black colonies on Hectolans agar and TSI agar. Remember that I told before that Shigella does not produce hydrogen sulfide, and so Shigella species grow in green colonies on Hectolans agar. Now let's talk about the virulence factors. The first one is endotoxin, and by now you should figure out why she has an endotoxin. And the second one is VI capsule, which allows the salmonella to survive the complement-mediated damage. Okay, let's move on to the clinical part now. First, we have salmonellosis. Now, there are two types of presentation depending on the species of the infecting salmonella, which are typhoidal or non-typhoidal. Typhoidal salmonellosis, also known as typhoid fever or enteric fever, is caused by salmonella typhi, and it's characterized by fever, constipation followed by diarrhea, and occasionally rose spots rash. When S. typhi is ingested in large amounts, she begins the infection at the ileocecal region and results first in constipation. Salmonella typhi has a special mechanism that allows her to get into the intestinal cell, but we will not go into the details of that today. In the first week of infection, salmonella typhi invades the bloodstream, which will cause systemic symptoms, mainly fever, remember that's why it's called typhoid fever, and may also result in rose spots rash. During this period, the blood culture usually will be positive. It is important to know how S. typhi spreads through the bloodstream. This happens by invading macrophages, and once inside the macrophage, S. typhi escapes the killing mechanism and replicates. After that, S. typhi leaves the macrophages and infects the biliary tract, or the liver and gallbladder, in other words, and from there, S. typhi enters the intestinal tract again through the bile. And all of this happens during the third week of infection, and at this time, S. typhi causes diarrhea, and thus stool culture is usually positive at this point. Now, there is also a milder form of typhoid fever, which is called paratyphoid fever, and this is caused by another species called S. paratyphi. And that's it for typhoidal salmonellosis. Now let's move on to the non-typhoidal type. There are two common non-typhoidal species, S. enteroditis and S. typhimurium. It's pretty hard to pronounce these names. These species invade the ileocecal region, and after the invasion, they will cause inflammatory response by the immune system, and that will be associated with an increase in cyclic AMP. This will cause watery diarrhea first, but also, these species can cause shallow ulcers, which will eventually lead to bloody diarrhea. Last thing we want you to know about in the clinical relevance is that salmonella is considered the most common cause of osteomyelitis in sickle disease patients, not the trait. To complete our discussion about salmonella, we need to talk about the transmission and vaccination. For salmonella typhi, it's only found in humans so it's transmitted by fecal-oral route. For the non-typhoidal ones, they are found in animals as well as in humans, and they are mainly transmitted through chicken products, but they can be also transmitted by reptile pets like snakes and turtles. Lastly, we have live attenuated vaccine for Salmonella typhi, but on the other hand, we don't have a vaccine for the non-typhoidal type yet. So maybe in the future you'll find the vaccine for it. Finally, it's time to put all of this together and understand how exactly we can form an algorithm that will put us on the right path of diagnosing which uh, species is infecting the patient. To start, we check if the organism is capable of lactose fermentation or not. If so, we're most likely betting on E. coli. If not, we need to do more tests. Next, we check if the organism is capable of oxidation therefore requiring the presence of oxidase enzyme. If so, we're betting on Pseudomonas. If not, we need to perform one last test. 
we check if there is any hydrogen sulfide production on TSI agar. If so, it's salmonella, and keep in mind that the clinical presentation would help in differentiating S. typhi from other salmonella species. If not, then we're betting on Shigella. Lastly, remember what we said about Hictones agar? Salmonella will grow in black colonies, and Shigella will grow in green colonies. All right? And this brings us to the end of this video. If you enjoyed it, please like it, share it, and subscribe to our channel, and hit the notification button so you don't miss our future videos. And as always, thanks for watching.